So uh, we're, we're here. Thank you for joining us. We're jumping back in uh, towards the end of Mark. We finished Mark out, another book on. It's amazing. It is. I know. I was looking at this list again. I was just thinking like, dude, I can't believe we've read this many books. I know. We sort of have check-ins every once in a while. And I, I don't know how you feel, but I mean, I love this. Like every, every, like the farther I go, like the more I love it. And it's okay. Like, and there are, there's busy weeks yeah. and seasons. And like today, particularly, I'm like, remember you were like, where am I? What am I doing? That's how I feel today. Yeah. But just working through them at this pace and connecting all the dots together has just been really helpful for me. I mean, I will say if if the spiritual formation team who led this initiative for the church to do this had, uh, I guess, a goal of increasing biblical fluency, I think I'm starting to see that in my own mm-hmm. just as I read Uh-oh. and go through. So yeah. it's it's working at least for me. I don't know if it is for anybody else, but I don't know that they had me in mind when they were planning that either. We so. really were like, what can we do for Ted? Ted? Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then we'll make him do this podcast. <laughs> Just to and then like check in. That'll through. be his yeah, accountability. That'll be his account- well, to, <laughs> in all truthfulness, if we were. <laughs> that really is if, what if, happened. If I wasn't on the podcast, I don't know how much I would have uh, been able to stick with it. But, mm, yeah. but it's, I, been, yeah. it's been good. I think we're, we're getting the habit, uh-huh. which is what I am most excited about. Like the fluency, like we're definitely getting familiar and we're seeing patterns and things like that because of the pace that we're reading. But I am most excited just about the women in my small group that we're all getting into the habit mm-hmm. yeah. that this will be hard to break in January, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. 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 God willing. You know, it's funny. I, I, when we first start out this, I'm thinking like, all right, I did some research. How many days do I have to do this before it doesn't feel like, oh, my God, I'm still doing this? And, you know, there used to be this research. It was like 30-something, and then it said it was like 60-something. It's like, oh well, I'm still all past that, and I still feel like that <laughs> at times. So I, I guess I'm an anomaly, but uh, it still is. It it doesn't feel like I have it yet. So maybe it will be for me the end yeah, of the year. the end of the year. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, but it's a habit that's also really challenging, oh, you know, yeah. and time-consuming, and there, there's a lot to it. Yeah. Yeah. And seasons. It's not just like eating vegetables. Which is easy. Uh, I don't I don't know. I've never done it. <laughs> you don't eat vegetables? No. You mean you oh eat some vegetables? Like, different... like you'll eat a salad or something. Yeah, right? I will eat a yeah, salad. That's vegetables. That's yeah, vegetables. Yeah. yeah, leafy greens. But like you wouldn't just put like carrots on your plate. I just don't love vegetables a lot. Oh man. Oh, who does? Great. Yeah. I love vegetables. Okay. True confessions. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess I like I'll eat vegetables, but I don't know that I love them. Oh, I love them. What's your favorite yeah. vegetable? I'm sorry, we're going off oh, on yeah. this. Like, this is a whole yeah. other podcast. Uh, I love Brussels sprouts. Okay, I love. I love, I love butternut squash. Do you cook um, them? Yeah. Oh See, yeah. I, yeah. I man, I just like made those. a butternut squash pasta, like just oh, pasta and but, oh man, yeah. See, I might okay. like them if you cooked for me. Uh, you don't know how to cook them well. I do not. Oh yeah, the Brussels sprout cooked the and wrong way. I don't way. enjoy Disgusting. cooking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. We'll talk about the Bible. No, it's all. It's all good. I'll get us back on track. I'm like, how many? Do what? It does have me thinking about like I you know I don't love vegetables but oh, I like them. I do. But I do. When you said Brussels sprouts, I'm like, ooh, I, I like those. Yeah. Which is a weird thing because you think like as a kid, you're like, oh, I'm not eating Brussels sprouts. Maybe it's because they used to get boiled and now. Oh yeah. They're all like. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure cafeteria Brussels sprouts I would not like. Yeah, yeah. cooked with yeah. bacon. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh damn. Yeah. Now yeah. you're talking. Yeah. Now we're gonna have to. Do what? <laughs> <laughs> That I said it quietly, so it doesn't count. Um, okay, so here we are, Mark chapter twelve. Um, you know, it's interesting. I thought, like, as I was reading through these chapters this week, uh, last week on the podcast, Matt Sherman was talking about, you know, in all these different characters, it's really asking this, the question, this idea of like, who do they say Jesus is, or who do they believe Jesus is? And I was just really struck with how much that was ringing true that is for the question. me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In a lot, in a lot of these situations, every, every single one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think I think in this this first one for me, what stuck out again was uh, I think wasn't it in the last sermon series the church did with uh, what was it called about the politics or something? Mm-hmm. Oh, what was it? I called? pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance. And the whole paying taxes to Caesar and oh. the whole uh, 
you know, they ask him, what do they say here? Should we pay? And he brought one and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is on this? Mm -hmm. They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. I think I remember when, I don't know who, which sermon I heard about it, but just this idea of, you know, we're all made in God's image. And so whose image you bear and are we rendering the things to God that are God's and like ultimately that's us. And so, I don't know. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, that's exactly what that is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even it's actually, you know, interesting because on the coin, it on one side it says this is, I think it's, I'll say the wrong name, Tiberius Augusta, but it's son of, son of the divine Augusta. It says son of the divine Augusta. Uh, and think about like we're asking who Jesus is. And on the other side, it says high priest on that coin. Yeah. that they gave to Jesus. So there are like so many trick questions in it and his response is so perfect and brilliant. And his response is, this is Caesar's image. And so give it to him. And, but yeah, you but are I, God's image. Yeah. So give your whole life. That's what that means. Yeah, and I, yeah. I just- Give yourself. I wondered if, if they recognized that, that they're made in God's image and that when he was saying that, that that's what he was uh, implying. Would the word likeness- yeah, that he I think that they did. to the coin, giving them like, what is my likeness? Yeah. My likeness is from creation, and yes. it's of God. That I mean, that's what I got from it. I hope that they would have. I think that they did, which is why they were in awe of his answer because uh-huh. they thought it was like the perfect trick. Like, yeah. what are you going to do? Are you going to tell us that we should be like we owe Caesar allegiance? What can you possibly say? And then his answer is so perfect. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. they have no response. There's a lot in twelve. I mean, even so, you were talking about how. The question is, who is Jesus? And and the, this first parable about the tenants, mm. you know, that's another thing that they would all recognize because he's describing Israel as a vineyard, which is from the book of Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah describes Isaiah as a vineyard, but then he talks about you know the you know God sending people and they reject, 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 and then he sends his son. So that's him yeah. telling. He's telling us yeah. at this point again, like. I am, I am the I son am of God, the beloved son. but no one else has said that yet, but he's still implying that. So it's another one of those, he's sort of telling people, but they still don't get it. Yeah. Mm. All right. What else in 12 on the backside? That was the other thing about Mark early on. I feel like the chat, the whole chapters were shorter. Though there was a lot in there. Now they're starting to get a little bit long. There's still short like stories in each chapter, yeah. but there's a lot more of them yeah. mm-hmm. in this section. Well, and this day goes on for multiple chapters. So like you think about, you know, the first half of the book and it's covering like two and a half years. And then we're zooming in on this last half and you get like, you know, a week of Jesus's life. But the third day that he's in Jerusalem, like it starts in chapter 11 and it's all of chapter 12 and then it runs into 13. It's like the first day he like goes in and does this one thing and he comes out and the second day he goes in and comes out. And then the third day it's like, boom, here are the details. Here are all of the things that he did. And it's like, because I, I was trying to track the days. Like, when do the days change yeah. to see, like, how the week is going? And this third day is seriously long mm-hmm. in this, in what, what Mark thought we needed to have of this day. Yeah, and, it's, and it, it really is about the, the immediacy because mm. it, it's, it is throughout all of Mark. Yeah, It's all like it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Send out the disciples because God's kingdom is at hand, you know, and Jesus is telling them I'm gonna die. But then we're, we're right in this section before and he knows it's coming. And so he's really trying to tell them over and over and over, this is who I am and this is what's coming. Like every yeah. single section is like, this is who I am and this is what's coming. This yeah. is who I am and this is what's coming. Yes. So it's so much warning here. Yeah. And yet they are confused. And they're still so confused. <laughs> yeah, which is one of the things that I had written down a question about just as I was wondering at, after the, the great commandment, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mm-hmm. with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then as it get, got down to the bottom, and when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far mm. from the kingdom of God. And then after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. I just wonder, like, if it seems like a weird thing to say that no one dared ask him another question. I don't, mm. I don't know that there's a specific uh, reason, but I remember that stood out to me. It's like, well, why would no one dare to ask him a question? Were they afraid of like, was it because so, of how he responded in those other things? Like yeah. in a way that they may have felt like, I don't know. Well, whenever this conversation's like spoken about in other gospels, it's a lawyer trying, scribe and lawyer are the same term. It's a lawyer trying to trick him. And, and so it's possible that there were people 
whoever it was that actually asked the question, but people in the crowd who weren't wanted to trick him, just like with the coin question. Mm. But his answer again is so perfect and something you can't argue with that they were afraid to ask him anything else. Yeah, you know, I think that's part of it. Like and, case closed. Yeah, like I don't know how to trick this guy because we're trying to get him con- to condemn him- himself because. Yeah. Once we get to the next couple of chapters, a large part of what Mark is doing is, is showing us that Jesus is innocent, his complete innocence. And so that's also what's going on here. You can't, he's not going to say anything wrong. He's not going to condemn himself. Yeah. But it's also, I mean, I think this is not in the other gospels when, when, he, when the scribe answers and he says, you're right um, to love him with all your heart and with all understanding and strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more and all whole burnt mm. offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus says, you get it. Yeah. yeah. You get it yeah. because a large part of what he's doing too is really condemning the temple in all of these sections of these few chapters. You know, he's saying it's, you know, it's corrupt. It's, it's gonna be condemned and it's gonna be torn down in the next generation. And this guy understood that that's not even the point that there's something new coming that's not sacrifices and burnt offerings. It's loving God and loving your neighbor and Jesus is going to make a way for that. Yeah, and I guess that's why I, I, the way I read it, obviously we don't get tone, but it's almost like you're right. And then just because he said you're right, everyone's, everyone's like, like oh, oh, we better not ask another question because that guy got it right. Like, <laughs> yeah, I and I, I don't, I don't know. even know yeah. what you mean. Can't handle yeah. any more of the answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, let's, let's, let's jump ahead to 13. Um. You know, the, I did find myself at times again, just like I, I was, I was struck with, again, in all the different scenarios. Like, okay, who are these people saying Jesus is with their interaction? And then, like, even today, when I'm not in that exact explicit scenario, but have I put myself in scenarios where I'm not responding the way I'm not indicating who I believe Jesus is? Uh. With, uh, so, I don't know. Maybe that wasn't in 13. Maybe that was more in 14. But I mean, I think that is part of what they're asking because they, so, you know, at this time, Herod is rebuilding the temple still. And it really was supposed to be one of the most beautiful buildings for hundreds and hundreds of miles around. And so his disciples are like, look, isn't it beautiful? And he's like, "Mm, it's going to be gone within a generation. And it is. Yeah. It's yeah. gone by 70 AD. And it really is, I think, this section to me, the hardest thing about this is understanding, is he talking about now or is he talking about the end times? That's usually the big question. Yeah. Right? Is that for y'all? Uh, yeah. I, I wrote, I mean, that Jesus doesn't answer their question when they ask him, you know, what will be the signs and um, when all these things are about to be accomplished. This is, he doesn't give them an answer to their question, but he tells them what they need to know. He says over and over again, be on guard. Mm-hmm. Um, do not be led astray. Stay awake. So he's, you know, they want this answer. And yeah. he's not going to, again, much like all these people trying to trick him, this is the disciples, but you know, he's not going to answer their question. He's going to give them the answer they need. Mm -hmm. And the answer that you need is you don't need to know when. What you need to know is how to be prepared. Yeah. And this is how you will be prepared. And it's going to be terrible. because 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 whether it has all already been fulfilled or whether it's like some of it has been and some of it's in the future, which is likely, um, it it was horrible in 70 AD, horrible. Mm. Like it's it's very well known from other historians like Josephus, the Jewish historian. It was a siege of Jerusalem. People were starving, like, like I don't even want to repeat something, like eating babies, like awful, awful, awful time yeah. whenever they destroyed the temple and burned it down and the pagans were inside the temple. So he's warning them, hey, when that happens, go. So there's some like some warning here, but also, but also, you don't know when everything is going to be fulfilled, but you are going to suffer. Mm-hmm. You are going to suffer. And yeah. I do think that's part of it too, because like, yeah. that's all throughout Mark. It's like, I'm the suffering servant, and yeah. you're also going to be as well. Well, and that's another upside-down kingdom mm-hmm. trait. I mean, you would think Jesus is here. He's the one we've been waiting for, and they don't understand that either. But then surely he's bringing in this new era you know, where we will be prosperous and yeah. illness will be gone. And, and he's, he's directly saying that's not true either. Yeah, right. that's, that's not, what that's it's not gonna how it's like. It, it, yeah. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Yeah. 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 
And also one other just is that he's going to be vindicated, you know, but you're going to see the son of man coming on the clouds. I mean, that is mm-hmm. this, but all these things are going to happen, but the son of man will be vindicated. So that's your hope at the end of it for Jesus, because he knows what's coming yeah. because he does. So he, he, he's doing all this stuff, giving, like showing that he has authority over the temple, you know, but he also is identifying himself as the temple because mm. he says, you know, you can, you, I will rebuild this temple in three days, you know. And so it's sort of this both thing. And so, but there's also this hope, but I'll, I'll be vindicated at the end of this. Yeah. All right, let's go to 14. This is probably where more of what I was saying about, uh, you know, you think of the, uh, when he was anointed uh, at Bethany with the, the lady with the, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just kind of, again, like recognizing who he is and like willing to like sacrifice, you know, image status, like what people might think about her and say about it. So I don't know. You're like both looking at me like, I don't know. What no, it's such about. a beautiful, I mean, Jesus says like everyone will know and we do. I mean, I just, <laughs> I, I love that. It's just a beautiful picture of this woman who like, I mean, think about how confused everyone is. And everyone's asking him for all the things. Like, I want to be at your right hand. Look at this beautiful temple. Like, I'll fight for you. And she just pours out this very expensive yeah. perfume just for him. I mean, without, She doesn't even say anything. Yeah. yeah. And without understanding, really. Like, mm. she knows intuitively or somehow who he is, but she doesn't really understand. Nobody does at this point. But she still honors him and worships him like that in that moment. It really is such a beautiful example. Yeah. Well, and he tells them again here, uh, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Yeah. I am going to die. Mm-hmm. And there's You know, like- they just miss it again. Like, yeah. I uh, listened to um, Derek Thomas uh, is a preacher who I listened to talk about Mark some. Um, and he said uh, that he thinks that the... Um, ill light that the disciples are shown in in the gospels is something that in his mind attributes to the authenticity of the scripture. He's oh, like, yeah. if you were going to write something about yourself afterwards, yeah. would you portray yourself as like didn't as get dim-witted it. as yeah. as the disciples just continue to and you know, and cowards. Right. Like and if if you're Peter whisper, you know, giving these things to Mark to write down like I, I don't know that I would be as um, truthful <laughs> in recounting. And uh, I mean... Especially because before they wrote this, Jesus spent time with them revealing everything they get and it giving now. them the answers and they yeah. have it. They so, know the yeah. most. So, yeah. so much, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. I, it's obvious to them how much yeah. they didn't know yeah. as they're writing yeah. because they do know then. Well, yeah. and we said it in the, in the, first, um, the first podcast for the book of Mark, that, that this is considered Peter's eyewitness. So not just all the disciples, this is actually Peter's eyewitness given to John Mark to write this. And so, I mean, Peter is especially, like, does not look oh, yeah. great yeah. Yeah. in these chapters. And it doesn't have his uh, redemption story with right. Jesus mm-hmm. is not captured in Mark, which is, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's always good, like, the, this idea, like, reading about the Lord's Supper. You ever, this idea that um, the blood of the covenant, which has been poured out for many, and just as you get an idea, this understanding of, like, you know, the, the payment, like, that had to be made, like, blood had to be shed, mm. and uh, just, well, Yeah. I think it's it's easy sometimes to think like you think when you're a kid and you see that like bridge illustration of like mm-hmm. oh I'm over here and God's over <laughs> here and there's some like sin stuff this chasm that like separates us and like oh we just lay across there and it's like Jesus makes this bridge and then we can like get to God but really the you know the amount of the reality the re- of yeah. the sacrifice yeah. yeah that it was yeah yeah it's so. simplified. Well, we simplify it all the time though, right? It's not just children's ministry. Yeah. Like if if we honestly lived in light of the blood. Yeah. Not the life of Jesus and you know, hashtags and things like that are that are catchy. Like if you were saturated in 
in this, in the truth of of his death. Yeah. Bodily mm-hmm. and also of his punishment. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think too, um, just just remembering uh, reading through this section this week because these are always the chapters that are, they're hard to read through, they're good to read through. You know, I'm always like, I should just read through one of the gospel narratives of this once a week. Mm. It'd be good for my soul, you know? Yeah. But also no, remembering that's what we're doing when we take the Lord's Supper together as a church. What's what we're doing is rehearsing it and remembering it. But that when he was sitting with them, he was, he was, he was retelling the Exodus story because that's when it was. I mean, mm. it was the Passover, Passover. Yeah. night. Yeah. yeah. And so they knew, like they were used to, they were used to, you know, taking the bread and eating the wine as the Passover. So they knew what it was. It was Exodus from slavery to freedom, being passed over for death and into life. I mean, this was their rescue story. And he said, and now this is me doing it for a new covenant. I mean, so it's there's just so much depth and beauty there. I mean, it's, it's not just from the Egyptians. Right, it's not from them and it's not just a totally new thing. It's like he said with the wineskins. It's it's a new thing, you know? Yeah. So we're doing something new, but it's all one story. It's yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. Oh man, there's so much there. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> um I mean, again, just reminded, it, you know, it's interesting. Like, I've read it before and just hearing again, like, maybe it's like, okay, maybe I need to hear this again today. But being reminded about, you know, uh, Jesus saying, uh, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Uh, yet not what I will, but your will. I mean, you just get a glimpse of, there's a little bit of like, oh, man, like, if there's another way, like, Maybe can we figure that out too? But ultimately, like, yeah. I mean, already whatever you say, I'll all do. All things are possible but, through God. Yeah. Yeah. So. And then, I mean, I I heard it said this way, and I've never heard it before. It's you know, it's so hard to understand that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And I heard this this week that Jesus was fully man to God and fully God to man. And this is such a great example of it. In this, to God, he's speaking to God and he is being fully man. Yeah. This is gonna hurt. I know what is coming. And man, in my humanness, I'm scared and I don't wanna. Yeah. Like, yeah. He, he so associates with us. You know, like we, he feels what we feel and he understands what we, what we go through and because he went through it. Mm-hmm. Yep, he's fully man, suffering servant, high priest who sympathizes. Mm-hmm. He really is all of those things for us. And it's so apparent when you're reading through this. And, and I was just thinking too, I mean, if, if, if Jesus, the, the son of God can go to his father and say, please take this cup from me. And his father can say, no, I should probably be ready to hear no for my prayer request sometimes. For my much lesser prayer request. And submit and submit with trust to the goodness and sovereignty of God. Yeah. That he is, you know, working all things for good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Obviously here at the end of this chapter is where we get Peter denying Jesus those three times. And, you know, again, like what uh, Matt brought up last week, you know, who, who do we say Jesus is? And, here was an opportunity to like omit that section or that part of the story, but you know, you definitely see in that moment what he was really like, and it causes you know it's good reflection for me us at times. It's like you know it's easy to follow Jesus when you're all in the uh, upper room and no one else is around, and you're just with your buddies and your church friends and everything's all. But when you're not in those scenarios and there's some like. I don't want to say like hostility, but like we no, have, no when threat push, of death. Yeah, yeah. When, push, when there's a when, cost to when pay. When push comes to shove, yeah, what are we gonna say? So. Yeah. Well, and it's it's heartening in our brokenness. I mean, I'm I'm grateful that Peter includes this because if Peter, you know, if if this is what he falls prey to, then how much more grace can I expect from from God when I because I'm gonna do the same thing? Maybe not exactly yep. this, but. I'm going to deny him in my actions or... We all have experienced that. Yeah. 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 Even after he directly tells us we will and we say, no, we won't. It's like, you probably (laughs) shouldn't. And then we do. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. 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 
And it's just, you know, th- there's, there's so much that happens so quickly in Mark and, and the juxtaposition last week was Herod and Jesus. And right here it's, you know, Peter and Jesus because he goes, you know, sort of back and forth between them in the gospels. And it's, you know, it's Peter denying who Jesus is, like, so lying to just save his, himself. And then it's Jesus who tells the truth, knowing he's going to die because of it, knowing that he is offering himself as a sacrifice for everyone. You know, there's just, I mean, it, it's like when you know Jesus, Jesus is, is going to do this alone. You know, he, mm. he, he is the Messiah. He is the only one who can save. He has his disciples and, and they will be his disciples. And it's going to be amazing to see. We see it in Acts, which we read through together. But right now it is Jesus alone. Yeah. All right, let's jump into 15. Do we have, yeah, there's 15, 16 left. We don't got a ton, ton more time, but I don't want to gloss over this because it's kind of a big deal. Yeah, I mean, this is <laughs> where he's kind of given over and crucified. And Although, so you said, I don't want to gloss over this, but this is all Mark gives us and he thinks it's enough. Yeah. So, I mean, and he's not giving us a bunch of detail and things that the other gospel writers included. He's getting straight to the point and this is enough. Yeah. Yeah. That is a good word. Um, all right. Let's jump ahead to 16. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is buried. The no, resurrection. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> He's jumping the death of Jesus. No, I, I'm, I'm not moving on. I'm I don't know. I don't know if you're kidding. <laughs> I just, like, it's got, not that it's heavy. I don't want to talk about it. I'll admit it. But I mean. Well, uh, I'll just tell I'm, you like something that I did in Mark specifically that it made me like think about. Okay. And one is just um, sort of, he, because it is so condensed, you sort of like see some like stark things. And one is that they're trying to get him to admit that he is the Messiah because Messiah means King of the Jews, which he'll say over right. and over in the next couple of pages. And that's a political statement for the Romans. I mean, that's all you need. So if you will admit that you are claiming to be the King of the Jews, then you'll be crucified, period, because that's what the Romans did. Um, but then he also gets to blasphemy, which is, you know, you're the son of man coming on the clouds. So that's this, you know, di- divine statement that he's giving. So he's condemned by the politics of the world and the pagans. He's condemned by the Jewish elite. And then there's even this moment whenever he's, you know, Pilate offers to, you know, exchange him for um, Barabbas, Barabbas. And, he, and he is. And so it's, it's also this personal exchange. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, there's these, the powers of the world, you know, the people who are supposed to be God's people, you know, who are supposed to be, you know, keeping, keeping the vineyard and who don't and who kill the son. And then there's our own, like, really, he really is exchanging himself just for every single individual. It's just, there's so much mm-hmm. in what is going on with Jesus just in this little section that he gives us. I feel like that's a good summary of 15. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay if we move on yeah. to 16? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, 16, the end, end, end of the, the last chapter here. Um, yeah, I mean, this was definitely a, a little bit different than the other, like you just said. You know, you're not getting as much. Yeah. Um, the thing I remember was where it talked about, I didn't, uh, where was it? When he appeared, uh, where did it say it? And maybe it was just in my translation. Uh, appeared to the eleven? No. Oh, he appeared in another form. I was in twelve. Uh. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them. So, like, was he? Because it didn't. It didn't really indicate that in the in Luke when we read this. That like I know they had a hard time. Like they didn't recognize him, but it's just weird. Another form, like. Verbiage. Like he was like really like something somebody else or do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I think I think referring to Luke is probably the best thing to do there because we don't really know what that means. But but somehow he was recognizable but not you yeah. know, he was the same but different after his resurrection. But also I just I know Matt mentioned it last week, but we should just mention that um the reason why probably in your Bible, this last section's in brackets is mm. because most biblical scholars agree this really wasn't a part of uh. the gospel of Mark. 
Um, and so that's just good to take note of. I mean, there's not very many things that are going to be in brackets, even if it's disputed, but this is pretty much recognized it's not a part of Mark. And so um, that's okay. I think that can make some people nervous, but there's nothing, whether it's in or out, there's nothing that doctrinally matters. There's nothing that's different than other gospels. So, so it's just what, not in most what earliest What you're saying is in earlier copies, in the earliest, manuscripts, it's not 16 ends... With eight. With eight. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's helpful. Yeah. Which follows with the the pattern that Mark has given us, you know, that it ends with, and they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid, mm -hmm. which is how all the big stories end in this book. They don't get it. They're confused. And so it... Yeah, that kind of like, lines up. Yeah, as a non-biblical scholar, <laughs> that I mean, it makes sense to me. It follows what Mark has been teaching us yeah. to to hear from him in this book. Yeah, you you can, if you end with eight, you can ask yourself the same question, which is, so who is he and what does it mean? Yeah, which is what he's been trying to get us mm -hmm. to do the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I guess we can assume that like the the reason why this is here now is somewhere along the line— Either somebody added it to it or... Yeah, okay. because because they were like, we also know what happened from other, so we're yeah. just going to pencil right. in what happened. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it would be, which we it see like in the other Gospels, letter. which are also very, very old. Yep. Yeah. All right, that's interesting. Okay, Psalm. I know we're... Well, we're, can I just say yeah, one more so, thing? Yeah, you can. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Run out of time. Just because... Again, the question is, who is Jesus? And Mark begins the gospel with saying, this is Jesus, the son of God. Um, and then, you know, God says, this is my son. Mm -hmm. at baptism, he says it again at the transfiguration. Mm -hmm. um, but then no one else says it until oh. after the crucifixion. Yeah. And then Roman. this Roman soldier, Roman soldier says, yeah. surely this is the son of God. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that is so amazing that, you know, no, he's the first human to actually get it after all the things that like God's saying it, Jesus saying it with his, you know, parable of the tenants, like all these things. And finally, he's this Roman soldier, you know, who's part of the world, who's sitting there at his crucifixion and part of it. And he says, this is the son of God. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where he ends. And so that's just so hopeful to me, you know, that, that it can, that not only can it take us that long to really see who Jesus is, but that anybody can see who Jesus is. Yeah. I mean, they don't have to know the Old Testament. They don't have to understand all these references, but they can just see the reality of who he is and his sacrifice and recognize who he is. I remember reading that and thinking it was just in the way that he took his last breath that caused him to say that. So as it said, uh, uh, he stood facing him, saw that in the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was a son of God, which it could be technically maybe not like, forget all the events that led up to that, that he was maybe witness to, but just even in that one little thing that it clicked. And so yeah. it is pretty profound. And you never know what it is that's going to click with somebody, yeah. what it is that they're going to see to recognize who he is. Yeah. That, what you just said, made me think of, though, the lawyer who asks him about the most important commandment mm -hmm. because he gives the right answer on paper, right? This, so if, if he is the scribe, he knows the Old Testament thoroughly. Jesus is answered with direct quotes from the Old Testament. This guy's going to recognize as the Old Testament. And so he's following the teaching of Jesus in, in the, you know— um, you know, in the logical thought procession way, but Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So he's saying clearly, you are not in the kingdom of God. You can have this knowledge. You can know that what I say is true, but unless you confess Jesus as the son of God, as, you know, the one atonement for your sins, which you see the Roman do. So yeah. it's, it's like an interesting juxtaposition, yeah. this guy who has all the knowledge but doesn't get it. And there's lots of them in this book, in all of the Gospels. But then, like you said, this guy who needs only to just see it. But you have to make that confession. Yeah. That's, that is, that's the, you know, line that you mm -hmm. have to step over. So. Psalm, 
Yeah, I was saying, yeah. Rachel, are you ready to move on to the song? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, there's but like I will 10 more hours you want to talk about? <laughs> yeah. No, I am. Psalm 42. I don't envy you guys this every week. I mean, just taking yeah. all of, you know, what God has shown you that week and, and surely the conversations that you're having and boiling it down like this to, you know, what are my two points from chapter 15 or whatever. Yeah. This, is a, this is a tough job, y'all. Kudos. Kudos to you. Well, yeah, I don't know about that. Kudos to Ted. <laughs> okay, wait, I'm still getting there. That's okay. All right. Uh, oh, wait, I'm in Isaiah. That is not Psalm. <laughs> Jeez. Where's my... Oh, it's before that. Uh... Psalm 42. See, now I'm, I'm having to get there. Well, then I'm going to start with the beginning, although you're okay. the host and I'm the guest. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to read I, it? Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Is that what, is that what we're doing? Should oh, I no, read no, it? no, 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 no. You can talk about it. Okay. I, I was just going to say that I am just so struck by the neediness mm-hmm. of the author, by the neediness and, and the dependence. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's so emotional. I'm, I got it very emotionally and it, it yeah. I, I'm trying to learn to be needy of God. And so reading this was like, oh, yes. It just, yeah. Well, it's definitely a psalm of lament, kind of like it's like this, there's like this anguish or this, um, I don't want to say it like what, what's. Yeah, is, lament. Yeah. But it's almost like, you know, sometimes like in a situation, like something bad happens, you can either like run to God or run from God a little bit. And like in this moment, I think I feel, always feel like when when we uh, lament, that's like a healthy way of like running to God to with something, God. as opposed to just being like ticked off or angry or some other like crazy Bury emotion. In it's it. like yeah, bar- like running away from God. So it definitely, you know, anytime there's lament like this, like you can kind of feel the heaviness of the potential flip side. Like mm-hmm. what? So I don't know what the hope is at the end. Yeah, I, I. I th- I loved reading this psalm at the end of this week because of how Mark probably ends with this. They were afraid, you know, and scared and lost. Um, and that that's okay. And like we have the really good gift of knowing the whole story and we have the other gospels so we can read through those. And, but, but to sit at the end of Mark and really, and really like sit in the morning of mm. like Jesus's death you know, and why he had to do that and the darkness that overpowered that moment um, and why he had to. Um, I mean, that was just a powerful way for me to end this week too, was sitting in like a song of lament, a psalm of lament like this. But then knowing at the end, like all Psalms and like all God's stories, that there's hope, there's hope. that we know what the hope is. But being okay, like, like you said, sitting in the need and yeah. also just the sadness, the reality of sin and death. Yeah, I think it was a five and eleven are the is where it repeats. Mm, mm-hmm. Did it do it any other time? I didn't remember that, but I think that it kind of sums it up a little bit. Like, why are you cast down, O oh my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. Mm. It's like, yeah, 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 and even just. To me, one of the, you know, we, we talk about just Jesus sympathizing with us in the garden, but on the cross, you know, why have you forsaken me? And he's referencing a different Psalm, which we've talked about that ends in hope and vindication too, but just, you know, it's okay to cry out and then knowing that there is hope, yeah, that God is with us in all those moments and that there's vindication and hope at the end of it. All right, I think that about covers it. Yeah. Rachel Fisher, thank you for being here uh, today and having. making Rachel time for Fisher. us. Mm-hmm. I, I, if I just said Rachel, it was like, you know, because it's Rachel and Rachel. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Awesome. Well, thank She's you. The best. Thanks. Yeah, till next time. Yeah. yeah. Rachel the first. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's Bible reading recap. We hope these conversations are helpful as we all seek Jesus and his word. Listen, if you go to clearcreekresources.org, we have a lot more resources dedicated to helping you study the Bible. Because when we open the Bible, God opens his mouth. Let's continue to seek God in scripture together. We'll see you next week.